Hey friends, welcome back to Rewildology, the show all about conservation, travel, and rewilding the planet. I'm your host, Brooke Mitchell Norman, conservation biologist and adventure traveler. Did you have a childhood experience that set off your life's path? What was that moment? Were you at home exploring your family's woods and discovered your connection with nature? Were you on a trip abroad and exposed to a phenomenon that deeply moved you? Maybe your moment happened in college and a professor said something that completely changed your perspective. When did you know that you wanted to do what you're pursuing? Today's guest, Pedro Frué, vividly remembers the exact moment that he decided to study and protect dolphins as his life's mission. Surfing off of the coast of Casino Beach in southern Brazil, Pedro encountered bottlenose dolphins for the first time and fell in love with the species. Casino Beach has a culture focused on ocean conservation, and every summer that his family visited the area, his love for the ocean grew. He later received his PhD in biological oceanography, and with the help of his colleagues, he determined that the bottlenose dolphins he swam with as a kid was their own subspecies, the La Heels bottlenose dolphin. Through his studies, Pedro discovered that only 600 individuals currently exist in the population. Now, he's focusing his attention on the local community to reduce bycatch, the species' number one threat. Pedro is a 2021 Whitley Award recipient, which is how I met him. The Whitley Fund for Nature provides support and training to grassroots conservation projects around the world. The Sir David Attenborough is a WFN trustee, which just shows you how prestigious this organization is. If you have a grassroots conservation project that needs funding, I highly recommend checking out WhitleyAward.org and apply for one of their grants. I loved my conversation with Pedro, and I'm very excited to share his story with you all. I'm thinking we might need to get a group of us together to visit Pedro and Casino Beach. COVID ruined my trip to the Pantanal, so I'm looking for any excuse to travel to Brazil. Who wants to go with me? Send me a DM on Instagram. If you're up for a South American trip, maybe I'll just have to put one together. If you're liking the show and have a free moment, subscribe to this show so that you never miss a future episode and give the show a rating and review wherever you're listening. If you'd like to join a community of other awesome conservation-minded folks, join the Rewildologist community Facebook group by clicking in the link in the show notes or searching for Rewildologist. Alrighty, everyone. Now on to my conversation with Pedro. Thank you so much, Pedro, for coming on and visiting me today virtually in Brazil um, <laughs> to join on Rewildology. So I love to start really painting a picture of who you are. So let's go back in time and explore some of your history. When did you know that you wanted to go into wildlife conservation? Yes, that's, well, that's a good question, and uh, I I am connected with um, with the marine life and the wild since I, since I was a child. Um, I grew up in in, in, a, in a city that's the capital of the state in South of Brazil. It's relatively far from the sea, but my uh, every summer I my family travel to the coast to the Casino Beach for spending holidays on the coast and. Um, Every summer, my mom, my father, and and all people around uh, all the time make me uh, feel very, very positive and connected with with the beach and the marine life. So I I started I started to to, to surf when I was uh, 12 years old, and uh, during this uh, this uh, surf session, I have my first contact with the, with bottlenose dolphins. And then in this makes me uh, much, much more connected with the wildlife. Um, on the other hand, this uh, Casino Beach, we have a, a university that has uh, the course of oceanography. It's the oldest, the, the first course of uh, oceanography in Brazil. So wow. we, have, we have a culture here about all this uh, all the, the protection of the marine environment and level and on the coast we have many NGOs that were funded by people uh, that uh, for oceanograph oceanographers and uh, and this makes a culture of uh, of conservation biology here mm. when i was eight, eight years old 
I did a course, a summer course with these guys in the NGO called NEMA, that is in Portuguese, Núcleo de Educação e Monitoramento Ambiental. And I, I, it was so good, so good that I repeated it for um, four, four times. Wow. And every, every, every summer. And, and this course was 20 hours of course with, uh, with children, with uh, young people to understand the, the, the ecology of the beach and the interactions between the marine life and people to explain the process regarding the ocean and, and the marine life. And I was so, so happy with this and spent all this time there. So it was some, uh, it was not only uh, one, one thing that makes me to decide to, to move on on the conservation bi biology, but it was many things that happened in my life when I was young. I had a neighbor, uh, I have a, some neighbors that they are um, professors on the university on the oceanography wow. campus. And these guys, they all the time was explaining my, uh, to me the process of, uh, about the, all my, my curiosities about the ocean and, and the weather and, and, and storming and, and why, why the storms happening and, and, this, and this, all these facts. So it's this, all this thrift forces, I, I would say it was this, uh, the NGO uh, training when I was young, my family and, and, the na and my neighbor. No. <laughs> that, that is, a, a, I, I would say that his name is um, Professor Norton Janukka. Wow. So this is when I was young. After that, I, I and I have uh, this connection with the dolphins, with the with Baranas dolphins, the Lahil Baranas dolphin. And I think that was on that time that when I was maybe 14, 16 years old, I decided I, I want to, to make the difference and uh, to, to prevent all this uh, beautiful ecosystem to, 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 de to, de de to degrade, degradate or to be polluted and uh, for, for these animals to, to decline. And after that, I, I met one guy when I was on the university, when I was cursing the biology, the, the biology course. I have the opportunity to know Lauro Barcelos, that is the director of the Oceanographic Museum. That's part of the federal university that's based on Rio Grande City. And this guy helps me a lot. He, he is the man, my mentor. He's um, opened the doors for me for, this, for science, for conservation planning. And then all the time helped me, helped me to, with uh, all his forces to, to make me a better person and a better scientist. And, uh, and yeah, this, this is in very, very, very brief, it's the, a little bit of my story on how I, I am here today to, and talking to you yes. about, this, about my professional life. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. So um, what were your degrees in? Did you end up getting your PhD or your master's or your bachelor's? Um, so what was your like educational stepping stones? Yes. No, I am a biologist. After my bachelor, I, I did a master degree at the Federal University here in, in Rio Grande in biological oceanography. And after that, I did my PhD in biological oceanography as well in the same university. But I, I did my PhD in a cototel program that is part of my PhD was here in Brazil and part was in Australia. In South oh, wow. Australia at Flinders University that I spent one year doing some genetic studies on there. And, uh, and this is uh, like the, my, my degree uh, story. Yes. I was, just, just to let you know, I was, uh, as I was in a postdoc position last year in um, developing some conservation projects with cetaceans that they are my, the reason to be <laughs> here <laughs> to, to do the conservation. And, but now I am, um, I have a position on the, um, I'm not sure how to mention this in English, but it's a, a secretary of environment of this, of the city, of Rio Grande City. Wow. So, yes. And so now it's, now it's, this is what's going on now. <laughs> and, That's and, wonderful. 
So it sounds yeah. like you're going to have a major impact then. So you're part of like the government now, like the local government. Did I interpret that correctly? Yes. Wow. Yes, yes, yes. Heck, Thank you for, yeah. trans for translating. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I got you. I got you. No, that yeah. was perfect. That was great. Oh, yeah, so as I was rewatching that beautiful presentation that was put on your work, when did you discover that the Lahil's bottlenose dolphin was its own subspecies? How did you figure that out? Yes. Well, in fact, it was not only me. I'm just part of this process. This is very important to make clear. It was uh, colleagues. It was a, a, a pieces of a big puzzle. And I, I was part of this publishing one paper on genetics. But I have some other colleagues that they are taxonomists and they, and, and they published a paper showing that morphologically these animals were um, completely different from bottlenose dolphin cells here or wow. the, the, the oceanic bottlenose dolphins. And, of, and using the, gen, the genetic, the genetics study that I, I have published in the past in 2014 and then after another one in 2017, uh, the information was used to make strong these evidences the, mm, mm -hmm. to sum on and to on this puzzle and it's, um, so now it's accepted by the by the, the, the committee on taxonomy from the society for marine mammalogy as a, a subspecies but in brazil uh, the government uh, accepts this as different species and uh, the publisher that was paper in, in by, by my by our colleagues, um, it was published in the Journal of Mammalogy, and uh, they published it call, calling for uh, dif a different species and not a subspecies. Oh wow! But this is just taxonomy. Uh, I think that the the point is they are a different entity. They function as a different en entity that's completely isolated, reproductively speaking genetically speaking and morphologically speaking from the adjacent populations of bottlenose dolphins here and they behave very different as well they have uh, specific behaviors that is associated to, to the coastal areas they go inside the estuaries and the distribution is very very short it's uh, only between southern brazil and argentina and 90% of the sightings of these species are um, are very close to the coast. Mm. They're very close on, within the one one mi uh, mi nautical mile, I would say. So they're very, very coastal animals. And this makes them very vulnerable as well. Mm. <laughs> and so that so that so that's the perfect segue. Um, so it sounds like then they're coming probably in a lot of conflict with humans then if they're constantly on the coast. So in your research and your colleagues' research, what have you found have been some of the biggest threats to these dolphins? Well, there are several threats for dolphins that are living on the very close to the humans. As we are, as a human beings, we, of course, we, we need to develop, we need to do some uh, construction uh, industries and people need to fish and all these um, have some kind of threat for for these coastal animals pollution as well but today i would say that the most uh, acute threat that we have is the bycatch on the um, on the gillnets uh, mm. and, and on the artisanal gillnet i would say and um, some dolphins die uh, every year from being captured and on this on the units the numbers are not huge because the population are not huge the population is very very small talking just thinking about the whole subspecies we estimate it's it's half but it's the estimate that you have today it's it's rough but the numbers are less than 600 animals alive wow that's insane Yes, and um, here in Casino Beach, where I am based on, we have that's it's part of the Pats Lagoon. We have the Pats Lagoon estuary, that's the world's chocolate lagoon, and uh, and the coastal areas. We have the largest population of La Hills bottlenose dolphins. It's, some, it's a resident population that use the the estuary on a daily basis, 
and we have another coastal population that are just going that do not use the estuarine waters stay on the coastal area and there are different uh, different populations in, in terms of uh, the the animals that compose each one of these units and you have uh, considering the estuarine population of Lahir's Baranas dolphins in the coastal one here we have about 100 120 animals and this is the largest population for the whole subspecies we have maybe two um, a record a record of uh, six animals being captured every year this is the Ooh. minimum estimate and this the number sounds very out oh, but it's not a large number but the the problem is that the population so is very very small and having two captures in fishing nets every year removing animals from the population as these uh, the, as the lahios baranos dolphins as almost all cetaceans are very slow growing and uh, slow reproducing they don't have the, um, the capacity to replant to 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 re how do you say this replenish uh, or replace to replenish, yeah. to replenish yeah. or, re or replace this uh the, the numbers that are being by mm. so we face a very acute threat that potentially is is affecting the population to decline in a medium term and for sure if this if the fisheries change the area or change the um, change the effort this can be very the the, the numbers can be uh, much um, higher than than six animals so the f fisheries they are very very dynamics you know and this is something that that uh, we should uh, be monitoring in close detail to detect any change in fisheries and in numbers of dolphins being being uh, being caught and how this is affecting the population dynamics as well so this mm. is why we are we are monitoring these animals since 1974 that is the first uh, effort that we have for for the research with this population wow that's amazing. And so since you you all have identified that bycaught dolphins or just bycatch in general is one of the biggest threats to them. So how do you engage? I would imagine it's the local fishermen or if there's more of a commercial fishermen or industry there. How do you engage them into this conversation? Like, what do they think about all of this? Do they care about the dolphins? Or in your experience, how, how do you help solve that? Yes, it's, um, this is a good question. And this is why the Whitney Awards is so important on, the, on this time. I am, a, as I said before, I, I am a scientist that, and... and doing science it's of course that's very very important step but what we have uh, detected in the last uh, in the last decade maybe is that uh, only doing science and publishing the papers is not enough to protect the animals as we have a social problem together and it, it's uh, it's very hard to to convince people the people that are giving money that uh, that we should look for the social approach to together with the science based on because the most uh, part of charities of people that are giving money for research they do they just give for the research they do not give for social science together with the research mm -hmm. that the monitoring that we are doing with dolphins it's normally they do money for do surveys and do more surveys and this is again why the, the the Whitley Awards is so so important at this time. We have established with all this data that we are collecting for the last twenty years. We have the Brazilian government have established a, a, a protected zone for the bottlenose dolphins here in southern Brazil, where we have the largest population of Latios bottlenose dolphins. The the fishery was banned from this area, and uh, in two thousand twelve, but to be to to start it. To, like it's a paper problem it's it was approved in 2012 but in, during two years the fishermen should have the 
uh, all the information. So between 2012 and 2014, it was only the process to inform people and ta ta ta. So the um, protected area should be uh, start starting on 2014. Mm. But since then, we we have start, uh, we have seen that um, the, the protected area is not working oh. because the animals are still dying on the protected area. They are fishing in there. The 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 fishermen is still uh, fishing. Of course, that it's it's not all the fishermen that are not uh, respecting. So what you have today is we have a protected area for the animals, but we have people fishing illegally inside. We have um, the public power um, doing enforcement. That's that's not enough. Arresting people, so it's a social conflict, and the, and the environmental problem, the conservation problem, persists on, on the time. And uh, and our question was, uh, why this is happening? Mm -hmm. Why? Why we are failing to protect these animals uh, as we help this uh, the protected area established by the federal government, and why they are disrespecting? And we started to interview some fishermen, and they it was so clear on on this. Uh, it was very preliminary study that there was no no social study with the fishermen when the protected area was created. It oh. was, a top, it, it was a, 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 we call here a top-down decision making, mm. and and so and the government uh, failed to to approach the the, the fishermen and to and to consider this, uh, this the, all this community as part of the process, and this is uh, why it's not working. So the weekly award. With this project that we we approved now, it's the chance to bring people together for the process. We one of the, the I would say the general aim of the project is to work to monitor the dolphin population to see what's going on with the population dynamics. But the most important is we're gonna interview the fishermen. So we're gonna interview the institutions that are uh, that are. A part of this of the law of, or to, to to build the laws here, why how they are communicated with each other, how they are communicated with the fishermen, and after to uh, and, and and identifying the gaps, the communication gaps, mm. and and have all the 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 knowledge of the fishermen to the, bring them to the process and make making these people part of the decision to find a common solution. This is something that's very hard to do, but the community respond, responded in, in this preliminary study very well. They And why they will contribute? I think that this is your question and uh, I sh I, that I should place my answer is because they claim to be part of the process because they feel that they were ignored and they yeah. are very happy, happy to contribute, to be part of the solution, and 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 it's a it's a very very challenging uh, project, I would say, because it's much easier to work only with dolphins, <laughs> to watching the population dynamics, to uh, an analyzing data and writing papers in the on on the office with your door closed. It's much harder, much much harder. To go outside, to listen people, to identify the gaps, to, to identify opportunities, to share experience, and then to make the, uh, all all this all this data together and say, okay, so with this, how can we do? How can you conserve the population of bottomless dolphins and other endangered species, and at the same time allow the fishing to fish here, the, to the fisheries to develop as well. And this is very, very challenging. So we are, this is the way we are putting our energy right now. Mm. Oh, that's beautiful. Yes, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, this seems to be 
such a common theme when areas are quote unquote protected. They are now just a swath of land or piece of ocean that is now protected under the government, but not all stakeholders were brought into the conversation. And so then somebody is left out. Somebody is hurt by this piece of land being protected. And then, I mean, there's so many issues that can arise with that. And we see that all over the world. You know, some people have to move out of their homes and out of their ancestral land because a national park is being established. And um, sometimes they're not treated fairly. And it sounds like one of the most important stakeholders in this situation, the fishermen, was completely left out of the conversation. So that is wonderful to hear that they are excited and willing to talk to you because in a lot of other situations that sometimes isn't the case or maybe they might just be so upset that um that they don't even want to talk to anybody so the fact that somebody's finally listening to them sounds like it's going to hopefully go well <laughs> in your exactly. experience <laughs> yes 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 it's uh i think that it's for Professionally, for the fishermen, it's better to be part of the process and to find a solution because the days, because nowadays, uh, this activity is being, uh, it's not easy because they should move to much far away to fish because the area is closing. Because some, some of, some fisher, fishermen are being arrested wow. and they are not living in, in you know, when we see this kind of situation, we just feel that we failed because this is, this is not right. It's not fair. And um, we, should, we should think different because they are artisanal fishers. Mm. They are not from the industries as well. Uh, that, um, and um, yes, I think that's challenging. But, you know, I'm very positive that, uh, that we can do it, that we can find a common solution or a better solution. And when I'm saying this is that I can't say that the bycatch will be zero. This is something very, uh, very hard to, uh, to, to say, but is that, okay, maybe the bycatch will occur, but you should reduce the bycatch for at the sustainable levels. And the bycatch today is not sustainable anymore. Because if you say, I would set a zero bycatch quota, let's say, it's uh, it's not possible to achieve in medium term. Oh yes, you can do it. Just say you cannot fish here and uh, anymore. And this is not the case. Uh, we should just find to a solution to re re reduce the pressure on the population. And uh, and and better that if you reduce the, uh, all this pressure on on, on the lahiu baranos dolphins with the fisheries, there are several other species that are. Uh, that are threatened that will benefit for, for this. Uh, it's a, how you say, it's some... An umbrella species? Are, it's umbrella species, yes, it's umbrella species. And, and the, the ecosystem here, the Pats Lagoon estuary, it's very, very important for the fishermen, for the society as a whole. And uh, I think that we have a very good opportunity to, to make the difference. Mm. It sounds like it. I mean... Just like in so many other places around the world, like these fishermen could potentially become your biggest ally. I mean, they are the ones that are on the water every single day. And as much as like, you know, us scientists would love to be around our species every single day, you could have a whole fleet of people out there that are your eyes and ears that are also watching the population. So not only could, you know, things, the, the social situation be leveled out, they could be brought into your research. And I mean, I don't know if you have any plans about that, but you know, me, I've studied a lot of just human wildlife conflict around big cats and some of those common areas it's, you know, with poaching and bush meat um, snare issues that are happening with that. And some of those people that are engaging in those activities could be the biggest allies because they know the wildlife best. And so if you become best friends with these fishermen, I mean, who knows? You might have like the best citizen scientists yes. out on the water with you as well. <laughs> no, yes, I think that uh, step by step, 
Yes. Uh, the, the, the first, <laughs> it's a, no, the first step is to have it's it's to understand their needs. Mm -hmm. This is what we, we're gonna do now. For sure that this will uh, approach to to the fishermen community much more than than we are today. We we we're gonna stay very very close with the with this uh, the, the, with these people. We are developing um, a mobile uh, application. Uh, this is part of the project that is financed by the Weekly Ar uh, Fund for Nature. Uh, to first, to monitor, to, to ask people from the community to monitor the legal, legal fishing. And a second one, to, uh, if possible, we are now uh, talking with these guys that we will develop the, 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 the mobile OTP to, uh, to ask to the fishermen to, to, to give the, the opportunity for the fishermen to be part of our project and uh, adding some information about the dolphins. As you said before, your comment was very, very, uh, very good to say that become the, the, the friend of the fishermen and if the fishermen can, can be part of your project or, or and contribute for science and and this is what we are uh, facing now we we have this uh, this challenge to make this this mobile application for for these fishermen it's a, it's an interface to start the, the process of fishermen feel more uh, part of this all, all the, the the research and the conservation process that you're doing mm. Oh, that's wonderful. It sounds like it's going to be a lot of fun and that the potential is so high for some really amazing things to come out of it. Um, having all these eyes and ears on the water that can help you. <laughs> so uh, what about the rest of the community? Um, so I know we've talked a lot about fishermen. Um, what about everybody else that's in this area? How do you plan on engaging them and what has been their reaction so far to the idea of having this project come in? No, yes. The, the community is, uh, in general, they are uh, vibrant with, well, with the Whitley Fund for Nature support, you know, um, just to make part of a foundation that has given uh, eight, 18 million pounds to more than 200 grassroots conservationists and benefiting wildlife habitats and communities in over 80 countries. So now you are part of this. And this is, uh, people here, they are very, very happy and uh, they are responding very positive. But for engaged people, that is um, more specific to your question, we plan to, to give some, uh, to train, to give some training for teachers, for the community, to act as a multipliers of knowledge and, uh, and on this course, we're gonna show the importance of uh, conserve the, the the coastal ecosystems, how they can benefit, how the conservation will benefit their lives in the future. And in fact, we are planning to train three kinds, three different group of uh, of people. That is the teachers, is the um, uh, uh, women from the fishermen community. Mm. And and uh, and other locals that the, that that deal with tourism here, that receive people because you know here we have a jet two uh, jetties that goes four kilometers to the sea, and these jetties has some rails and some cars that just sli slides. Is, is how you say this in English? Just go to these rails with wind. They call we call vagonetas. That's the wagons or something like that. I can show you. Okay. It's, it's, Almost like a big... it's not easy to explain English, but yeah, it's yeah. like a, so like a catamaran or like a big like um, is this is this the kind of boat you're saying? Like no, a really it's big not boat? a boat because it's on the, under the rocks, yeah, and you have a it's like a train, but oh, not a train. okay, it's okay, yeah, so yeah, mm -hmm. and, and then train rails that goes with with, with the wind. Oh wow! Yeah, definitely send me wind. pictures of that. <laughs> like yeah, a sail. I, 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 can, I can share with you. And okay, these great. guys, <laughs> these guys will be training as well in, so with some educational courses and to to they receive 
too many tourists and mm. so to, more and more and more to spread the, the word and, and and these jetties they are exactly on the on the mouth of the Pats Lagoon where the dolphins are oh so wow you can, you can watch the dolphins from the rocks and you're gonna train these guys to explain more and more and more and more about the, the bottomless dolphin population, how smart these animals are, and, and, and the value to, con to, to conserve all the, the whole ecosystem. So, and this is one, I think that's one approach to engage people. It's talking and talking and talking. And with the mobile application as well, and going to the internet, and, and we, we have uh, three videos or four videos that we for one two minutes to that we're gonna record and then broadcast on the internet and pay and pay for the internet to to spread the word. So wow. this will com communicate a little bit more with uh, all kind of different publics that are connected with our project. Wow! Yes, I love everything that you just said. That's amazing. Education is just so valuable. I've said, I've been advocating for years that education is one of the strongest tools that we have, period, for saving pretty much any issue. And <laughs> I'm, I love to hear that you are also focusing on the tourism industry. That's more of like my background as well as in conservation travel. And there's so much power in well-ran conservation travel. And so they could be your biggest allies as well. The guides that might be leading these tours, um, they can be ensuring, and they are also eyes and ears as well. So if they're always out with tourists, they can also be watching to see what's going on. And if anybody's breaking any rules and then really engaging and making people care, like why should this person from miles and miles or kilometers away care about the bottlenose dolphin? So that is awesome. Yeah, and those videos, yeah. whenever those are ready, send them to me. I will blast <laughs> them out as well. <laughs> yeah, for sure, for sure. We, the, the, this uh, the, the application for the for the this mobile application that that we are developing, uh, we we will um, train this group of people's people to to use them and to be uh, and to be. Uh, like a citizen science and yes. survival and surveillance and surveillance. So mm. this group of people that are connected with the marine life, with and lifeguards as well, that the, the lifeguards are all the time looking for the sea to report uh, by this mobile application to, to report uh, unusual behaviors of dolphins, the number of dolphins that are in, uh, passing through or illegal fishing as well. So this is, uh, this is one way to engage people, is to, to give training and to give the opportunity to participate in the project. The, the, this will connect people, wildlife, and the research as well. This is our plan. I Let's love see. it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I love it, I love it, I love it. Uh, my <laughs> master's, one of my big master's projects, I did something similar um, where I built this very very basic app um, to record big cat data that as people were out on safari. And so I'm so I just love the idea of citizen science because it is very powerful for getting people engaged and to make people care. So, as, but, so but, oh. <laughs> to give, but you should give and uh, I think that I am really excited with this as well. And to have all this data to be uh, robust or to be useful for us, we should provide training yep. for people so they, they will know how to use, how to report the data. Uh, it, you, you know, you, you, you don't need to be a biologist to be a scientist or to be part of a conservation project. You can, it's, it's, a, it's just a kind of uh, citizenship. Uh, just be a, a, a citizen that loves the ocean, that loves the ecosystem, that loves nature, and you can and you can help. We're gonna provide the um, the training and show you how to use the, the, the this mobile app for. Of course, that I'm I'm just telling much more about the La Hills bottomless dolphins and the, the the ecosystem here in Brazil. But a mobile application can be developed for any kind of, uh, of environment or situation. 
Right. This is this is something very good for the informatics. This uh, you know technology. It's it's amazing oh. <laughs> how they are doing. Yes. <laughs> Gosh, it's amazing. And that's another thing that I love about this so much. And I'm so glad that more and more scientists are opening their minds to the idea of citizen science, because, you know, there's so many papers out there that bash it. They're like, the data is invalid and blah, 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 blah. But just like you said, as you train the people how to use it, how to make correct observations, then yes, there is always some sort of some things might be a little off, you know, there's always those outliers and you're like, okay, we'll just sweep that under the rug. But for the most part though, you have all of these eyes and ears that are way more places than you are. And then it becomes a long-term wildlife study. That is what I love so much about it. So you'll have more data than you can possibly imagine about the uh, dolphin. So that is awesome to hear. Like, I'm just, woo. I'm so excited to hear this because uh, I, I care personally about this and I'm a big advocate for citizen science. And I did a very similar project, like I said, for my master's. So I've seen it work like it works. Um, and uh, that is so exciting. So you'll definitely yeah. have to keep me posted as that <laughs> develops because I, yeah. I want to stay yeah. up to date on that. <laughs> yes, yes. We are very excited with all this. And then it's it's challenging, but it's very um, how I say this, as, as, but I'm, uh, I, I, I believe that we're gonna succeed, and uh, and it's good that's challenge, you know. It's just to take you out of your comfortable chair and situation. <laughs> <laughs> take you right on that comfort zone. Actually, make some real impact. <laughs> yes, yes. Oh, let's go for it. Let's go. That's wonderful. Awesome. Well, Pedro, let's. I, I like to, um, let's shift back to you for a little bit now and, and get sure. to know you a little better here. So in your journey so far, um, what would you say has been your biggest personal struggle in going through everything that you have and how did you overcome that? Hmm, this question is very hard to answer. <laughs> it's a very good question indeed. Not sure if I have one like struggle, but I what I can say about uh, about my my history in doing conservation with this animal is that at least in Brazil it, that is a very hard uh, place to do science. Uh, I think that is you don't have uh, you can you don't have too much opportunities to. To do, to do the job that you should do about science and about conservation. And because you don't have, finan financially speaking, you don't have this, uh, the support. Mm. This is one, uh, how should we, I overcome this it was with persistence. I never gave up about my dreams and about what I think that's right. And, uh, this is a general and uh, it's general, but I think that's the most uh, challenge uh, issue that I that I faced along my this 20 years now. Mm. And it's it was uh, difficult to, to persist on time because uh, and, and, and have all this uh, history and and call and, and data collection and, and consistent surveys, having people together with you, training people, have other people involved and, and sustain and maintain these people, this uh, research group together. This is was the most challenged situation. It's not regarding the, the animals and not regarding the fishermen. It was regarding the research group to to be here with people that were training and still here with me with me yes mm -hmm. i think that this is was the challenge <laughs> the, the most challenged situation that yeah. i overcome and oh well we overcome pers with persistence to applying for funding everywhere and and succeed and have succeed in, in, in funding uh, applications this makes possible to be here mm-hmm and also giving you the platform 
which this is one thing that I love. So I, cause I never, I will be completely honest. I never heard of the um, Whitley Awards before, and that's how you and I connected. And the fact that they've also been so adamant on getting your name out there that, I mean, I, I mm, that is just so special because I mean, my platform is, you know, getting bigger and bigger as I grow this podcast, but someone might listen to this a year from now and want to connect with you. And who knows, that might be an opportunity for some more funding down the road as your project is really starting to get its wheels underneath its, you know, underneath itself and, and going. So, um, yeah, I love it. Persistence is key. Persistence is key. Uh, <laughs> yes, no, it's, it, it is because, uh, it's, it's, it's hard. It's a long way <laughs> mm -hmm. and it's easy. It's not easy, but it's part of the game. Sometimes you to, to just give up. A lot of people give up because it's, uh, it's much easier to, 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 to do another thing and, and, and get your money and, and live your life. And it's part of the game, as I said, it's part of the game, but it's, um, persistence for me is the most important thing in, in, along this journey. And this, the, the Whitley Awards, it's so important for me because they are not only giving money. They are training uh, people. They are <laughs> making the, the, our profile to the profile of the project to, mm. to be out there, uh, shedding lights on, on, on the project, international lights. And, and this, I'm very like, sure that this will give us the opportunity to have more and more support and funding opportunities. And it's amazing. It's, uh, it's amazing to have a film uh, narrated by Sir David as well. Yes. It's, it's, it's <laughs> That's a, a life it's goal like, for everybody. Yeah, it's like a dream <laughs> for any, kind, any biologist, yes. conservation biologist. I never imagined this, this situation. And um, yes, and uh, I'm, I'm very, very happy. Very mm -hmm. happy with this, uh, the support for the weekly foundation let's see the future and let's see how how you're gonna develop all this project if you succeed to reduce the bycatch of bottom of dolphins and to be connected with colleagues from south america we are very excited to to start so we are now starting the project we are now oh, starting that's so exciting and that's such an inspirational story as well to anyone, because I think that sometimes because funding is so hard to get, just like you said, it doesn't matter the country. I mean, some countries, obviously, it's harder than others, too. It, but it's just there's so much good and so much work that needs to be done and such a finite number of grants out there to help with all of this work that we want to do. So it's just so inspiring to hear you as someone that's been working on this for 20 years and Finally, you're like, I, I landed it. I landed that grant. And now we're going to do this massive project to save the species that I love so much. And, oh, it just makes <laughs> me feel all warm and fuzzy inside. That's amazing. That's amazing. No, yes, yes. And um, I, I, I forgot to mention for you that during my PhD, I have traveled with, uh, along the entire distribution of the, of the Rachel Bottom of Dolphin. So I have visited all this, uh, the, the, this uh, site where the species occurs, where we know at least, and collect some biopsy samples to, to do the genetic studies, mm. to define the management units, to define the population, food populations. And it was so good experience to travel around Argentina and Uruguay and in Brazil and connecting with people that has, have your, the, same, the same dreams that you have, that are fighting for the same reasons for the same purpose as, as well. And um, I think that this was as, as well some kind of, uh, that gives me some energy mm. to move on, um, you know, and connecting people and, and, and sharing stories and know different kind of, uh, of people and visions about marine conservation, about the life, because I, I you know, it's, it's not only about marine or conservation biologists. You are traveling and connecting people and, 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 and listen to beautiful stories about uh, 
about the life and the nature. And this was one of the key steps, I think, that I just forgot to mention before. It's, have you have you been traveled to South America? Um, so I actually, before the pandemic happened, um, I was supposed to go to Brazil. I was supposed to go to Pantanal um, yeah. to uh, go see jaguars down there. And then, of course, that trip got canceled for obvious reasons. <clears throat> um, I've been to Ecuador and the Galapagos. So that's about as far south on mm. this side of the globe that I've been. I've been all over Asia and Africa. But for some mm. reason, I haven't really been down um, to Brazil yet, which that's that's like so high on my list. I need to go. I need to go to Brazil. Brazil. And I yes. want to keep going down and go down to the Patagonia, um, to see the mountain lions down there. Because um, even though I live with mountain lions, I still have yet to see one. I don't understand <laughs> how this is a thing. So apparently, I need to go halfway across the world to see them, which I'm fine with because I love traveling. <laughs> Uh, so I'm fine with that. Um, but yes, so Brazil is extremely high on my list. I want to go oh yeah, all across the Amazon, all across the, the Pantanal. Um, and then it sounds like I need to go to your field site here and see some dolphins. <laughs> yes, sure. Sure, sure. Come here. And if you, if you come to Brazil, you know, and you know that here where I live, the Casino Beach, it's... It's a little bit different from the rest of the Brazil that maybe you, you have in your in your mind because here it's uh, we we are more it's a subtropical it's it's cold during the winter now it's nine degrees it's uh, we it's raining it's completely different scene different uh, culture I would say we are culturally we we have a lot of in common with Uruguay and Argentina. Mm, a lot mm -hmm. of, because here I am uh, 20 kilometers from, from Uruguay. Oh, well, that makes sense. <laughs> so, That's not far at all. <laughs> it's, no, it's, it's easier to go to Uruguay to, or it's, it's the, the, the way is shorter than to go to the capital of oh. my state. <laughs> <laughs> what would you say then is a good piece of advice for any biologists out there or anybody who's wanting to follow a similar path to you? Uh, be persistent. <laughs> Never give up and believe in your feel yourself and, and discover yourself and, and and be persistent because it's a long way. It's not easy. You should uh, be informed and uh, you should be informed all the time. Reading papers and reading what's going on outside and understand the vision of dif the different vision of people around you. And and call the people to the process of the conservation. Otherwise, you're gonna. Leave. It's it will be very hard to to do the right thing. Mm. This is my advice for now. <laughs> That's good advice. That's great <laughs> advice. <laughs> and how can somebody abroad, so say someone in the U.S. or the U.K. or Africa, how can somebody else um, that might not be where you are help with the Lahio Bottlenose Dolphin? Support. Causa, that's the organization in charge of this project. Uh, Causa, I, I, we we have a limitation now that we don't have a way to. That there's no no in, a way to to donate uh, something or, or to, uh, on the internet. We are working to do this uh, very very brief. Otherwise, you can just say some words for. For, to support our work, it's not only about, about money. We are very open to to listen, to discuss, and to to, to have uh, idea from outside. If you are in the U.S. or in South Africa, or in, in in any part of the world that's not the Patagonia history or Southern Brazil, you can just share your thoughts and and support our project. I think that this is the the best way now to to do some something for the La Hills Bananos Dolphins, indeed. That's beautiful. And if anybody wants to connect with you, maybe they have an idea or uh, maybe want to offer volunteer time, um, how can somebody connect with you? Oh, I can give you my uh, my email. So okay, you if, you, if you want to. <laughs> yes, that's no okay problem that. at all. Yes, yes. Uh, or the cause, the, uh, not sure. Can I, should I spell it uh, or... 
I sh I sent to you and you. If you want to go ahead, it. since this is an audio format, if you want to just spell it, and then I'll also make sure it's in the show notes. Okay, so my email is p f r u e t gmail dot com. Perfect. So p frue at gmail dot com. Yes. Perfect. Well, that's great. And of course, if anybody reaches out to me and they want to get a hold of you, I will immediately put you two in contact. So thank you so um, much for that. Yes, thank you. Pedro, for meeting me literally across the world and spending an hour of your day to talk with me. I can't wait to get this out into the world. <laughs> no, no I, I should say thank you for, for the opportunity to be here, the opportunity to share a little bit of my story, a little bit of the Lachia's Bottomless Dolphins needs and, and all the, what our research group is doing for the, the last 20 years. It's, uh, I'm very, very, very happy to to be part of your podcast. So when, whenever you have the, I don't know, the opportunity again, just call me and I can, I can come here to say how all the project is, is, is doing. And, and yes, let's chat again. Yes. Thank you very much. I would love that. Let's, let's stay in touch so that we can keep up yes. to date on everything as this develops. Yes. That would be wonderful. <laughs> Thank you very much. Awesome. Thanks, Pedro. Hey, thanks again for listening to this episode of Rewildology. If you like what you heard, hit that subscribe button to never miss a future episode. Do you have a cool environmental organization, travel story, or research that you'd like to share? Let me know at rewildology.com. Until next time, friends, together we will rewild the planet.